presented by Phoenix Rising. Welcome to the Digitize Your Negatives and Slides video. Do you or somebody you know like your parents or grandparents have a box full of negatives or slides or all your old family photos and memories that are sitting in a box that you can't do anything with without having to send them off or drag out a projector to even look at them? Uh, if you do and you want to bring those into the digital era so you can make a digital photo album, share them on social media, or burn discs or memory sticks and give copies to your family members, your loved ones who they're their memories too, right? Uh, if you want to do any of that or be able to just send a digital picture off of an old photo of your mom or dad to put on a coffee mug, pillowcase, whatever, then this video might be a good starting point for you. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking three negatives, 35 millimeter negatives, from the 1980s and we're going to digitize those using a cell phone, a budget desktop type of scanning device that you can buy, a DSLR or any camera really as long as you can uh, focus it, and a scanner that is equipped to be able to digitize film and negatives in addition to just you know photographs and regular uh, pieces of paper and stuff. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, index up next, then we'll do a tabletop. We'll talk about each of these four methods and then we'll show you the results of uh, what these are capable of. So stay tuned, lots of good content. Hey, like, share, and subscribe, and comment as you watch this if there's things you'd like to see, more in-depth reviews on using a digital camera, fabricating this stuff, etc. Hey, post some comments and we'll see about getting that out there to you. So, thanks for watching. Let's go to our tabletop. F2D Mighty Tabletop Scanner. Okay. Uh, first off, let's talk about our purchased items versus a DIY solution for being able to capture slides and negatives. Uh, I have two representative devices, and I say representative because this isn't meant to be an in-depth review on either of these. Uh, but if you're interested in that, hey, like, subscribe, and post a comment. Say, hey, can you do a review or show me how to use this, and, and we'll see about making that happen for you. So, that being said... F2D Mighty by Wolverine. This is a couple years old. The newer ones have bigger screens. Uh, this is a 20 megapixel camera sensor with fixed optics and a light tray that backlights your slides and negatives on the bottom that you will use to take pictures of your slides and negatives to turn them into, enter them into the digital age. Now, uh, pros and cons of these type of units are First off, the sensors they're using, if you're paying 100 bucks or 150 bucks for one of these, then you're not getting a big sensor high, you can get a lot of megapixels, but not a high quality sensor. It's just a cheaper point and shoot type of sensor in here with fixed optics that are of okay quality, I guess. And because of that, your results are not going to be as good as they are with some other options, uh, or likely, okay? Now, uh, pros, you can do this at the kitchen table. Plug a USB uh, power source into it, lights the backlight, runs the little bit of electronics that are in here in the camera, and you don't need a computer or anything to digitize your negatives. Now, downsides, very few adjustments you can do on this negative, and what I've found is that this particular unit, and probably a lot of them, the way they decide to expose uh, your negatives and capture the image may be a little bit off or a lot off in color or brightness and all that kinds of things. So really, if you're going to use any of these devices, you really do want to have separate software on your computer to be able to edit your pictures after you take them. And my experience with this particular one, if the colors were way off and I said, no, nah, I'll just capture it and then fix it later in processing, that was rather challenging, and I'm not sure why it shouldn't have been, but it was. Uh, so I ended up, if I was to use this, I would say 
tweak it to get it looking re relatively close in the scanner, which is going to take a little more time, which will save you time when you edit your pictures afterwards and dress them up, which you really will want to do using something like this. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say almost about the F2D Mighty. Uh, another thing about these devices, you drag all the extras out. Uh, they usually will be USB powered, come with a cable and adapter, manual. Uh, little brush to clean your light tray, stick it up in there and uh, dust it off so you don't have artifacts on unnecessary artifacts on your films and negatives and they're going to come with adapters. This particular one has a 35 millimeter slide adapter, 35 millimeter film, inserts for those adapters for 110 slides and films and even does 8 millimeter movies, the old, not old, uh, the old early uh, movie cameras for uh, families and stuff, personal use. And lastly, it does have an RCA output, so if you have an old analog input on your TV, you could actually show what you're doing and see it on the TV. Uh, so that's it for those, okay? Now, I'm going to stop and we'll get right back and look at our Epson. Epson V600 traditional scanner. Okay, let's talk about scanners that are actually scanning devices, not photographic based devices for scanning your slides and negatives. Now, what I have in front of us is an Epson V600 flatbed scanner that has the capability to do slides and negatives as well as reflective media like photographs and documents. Uh, you can find some of these that are dedicated, like Plus Tech I think is making some that seem to have good reviews and they're going to be significantly smaller and also use a scan head versus taking a picture and generally speaking uh, they'll do a better job than devices like our little F2D Mighty okay and you'll see all this in our examples now uh, negatives to the scanners are first off they tend to be larger more cumbersome they tend to need to be connected to a computer to operate, although some of them I do believe can function standalone as well. Flatbeds, no. Some of the portable film scanners might be able to. I'd have to research that a little bit. Uh, so those are the biggest downsides. They're slower, okay? Scan head has to slowly move across your negative or your slide or whatever you're scanning. And the higher the resolution you choose to scan something at, the longer that's going to take. Also, some of the image correction technologies for dust removal can double the scan time required or close to that, okay? So, takes longer, uh, heavier, bulkier, usually needs a computer to work with it. Uh, those are the downsides. Uh, this Epson scanner, I wanna say, was between two, 250 or so, uh, 200, 250 US dollars. Uh, so they're not super cheap, but they're not totally out the window expensive. And in the case of your flatbeds, you're getting a multi-purpose device that does more than just slides and negatives. So uh, that being said, not a bad option. Now, what are the pros of these devices? Okay, first off, in the case of the flatbeds, they're versatile. They can digitize a lot of stuff. And what allows them to do the slides and negatives are they're going to have, uh, your flatbeds are going to have an insert for regular media uh, to hold your copy or your, your photographs or printed paper down and you can remove that tray to have either a light source behind it in the lid or a moving head that is a light source that's going to scan along with your scan head and backlight through your negatives. Now uh, we'll talk about the Epson specific, but I, I'm not sure how the Canon or other brands work in this case, but we'll talk a little bit specifically about the Epson and maybe insert some pictures here. And when, you, when you're scanning negatives with the Epson, they give you two different trays to hold your media. They have one medium format film tray, which I've never used this in all the years I've had these type of scanners. Uh, then it has a 35 millimeter negative and slide or standard size slide tray. Now when you put this in here, the scanner can detect that you have this in and which way it's oriented so it knows if you're doing 35 millimeter negatives or slides 
Uh, it actually kind of doesn't lock into place but has recesses to hold it properly in place and position your media so that it's getting scanned. Now, uh, the, you do have to open, pop off the, the cover and a little bit of manipulation to get your two slides in, so a little bit of labor there, not as bad as, not quite as tedious as feeding them through like that little F2D Mighty. Uh, other pros to this thing are it's scalable on output. Uh, most of your pho your photographic chance scanners are going to say 20 megapixel or whatever, right? Uh, this thing can go all the way up to, I believe, 64 by 86 or something like that, 100 DPI, but true square, 6400 DPI resolution. Now, do I run into that? No, that is enormously time consuming. But I also scan at a higher resolution, and I'm gonna recommend this to anybody using this scanner or one of the dedicated film scanners. A lot of sources on the web will say scan at 2400 DPI. Uh, Personally, I go to 4800, and the reason I do that is, is actually, there's several reasons. First off, I want to do it once and be done with it, not have to ever come back and scan it again. I want to one-shot it. So by scanning at 4800 DPI, if I want to crop the image down and be able to get a still usable picture, I have the room to do it. I have the pixels to do that already, okay? Uh, another reason is, blemish and doing any post-processing correction uh, if I if I desire to on the output of this if I'm working in a larger area to fix a blemish or something when I blend that and smooth that out if I'm if I've got a hundred pixels from here to here versus 50 pixels it's going to be a lot smoother and a lot less detectable so you'll get a better quality output so uh, those are my reasons for scanning higher uh, at a higher resolution than most recommend, and uh, I'm just passing that on to you. Your mileage may vary. Now, so they're scalable, flexible in the case of the desktop. Uh, they can do very high resolution output, okay, if you so desire. And the last thing I'm going to talk about that your scanning type devices, most of them I think are now incorporating them, uh, that are capable of doing negatives or dedicated negatives, is they'll talk about having in the case of Epson, it's called Digital Ice, or in the case of the Plus Text, I don't know what they call it, but it'll say something about using infrared light to get rid of blemishes and spots, okay? Not just a software solution, it's a hardware solution to helping to correct your negatives. Now, the way that's going to work is your device is going to do two separate scans, or at least in the case of the Epson, I think all of them will do the same. Uh, you're going to scan the image just like you would to capture it. And there are dust removal options that you can use that use just to scan it, remove the dust, and out it goes. And then the digital ice option <coughs> comes back and does a second scan using just infrared lighting. Now, what infrared lighting does is it detects dust, cat hair, as you'll see later, uh, blemishes or scratches, physical damage to the negative where it's going to distort the light. But what it doesn't detect is the actual image because color negative film and color slides, the emulsion layers that create the color are transparent to infrared. So a second scan takes place and it uses the results of those scans. Anything that it does see, it knows is a damage or debris or some imperfection on your negative. And then it uses a software to specifically fix those areas, okay? And it works darn good, okay? But it takes double the time to scan. So I don't run when I use this. I don't use digital ice all the time. But if I have negatives that I can tell got some issues when I'm previewing them, I'll say, oh yeah, this needs digital ice. Because otherwise, for me to fix it post-processing could take an extended amount of time per image to individually fix all the damage compared to letting Digital Ice do the job for me. So Digital Ice is a big plus. Now, uh, one last thing before we go on and talk about our DIY options. Uh, what is it? Uh, if you're looking at these, and I'll, this is Epson specific, your Epson V550 and your Epson V600 for doing slides and negatives are the same. There is no benefit aside from maybe the add-in cheap uh, photo editing software or something like that. 
uh, as far as scanning physically between those two units. Now you will see that the V600 to market it, they said it has digital ice technology for photos. And it doesn't. It's not the same. It does work better, maybe. Better sometimes, worse sometimes than the normal spot removal, but it can't. It can't bounce. Infrared's not going, it's not using an infrared channel on your photographs like it is on a negative. So just keep that in mind. If you see a V550 and your primary interest is photographs, or not photographs, but slides and negatives, hey, if it's cheaper, the V600 is not that much of an upgrade. I had a V550 and upgraded to the V600. Uh, am I using it? Yes. Do I feel it's really an upgrade? For me, using my, uh, my separate software for doing photo corrections after the fact and stuff, I don't feel that it warranted me buying a new scanner. My other one would have uh, very little capability gained for buying another one. So anyway, uh, there you have it. Let's go ahead and look at our DIY. Making a light board. Okay, before we go any farther and talk about DIY stuff, uh, I wanted to talk about, really quick, building a light board because you're going to need a backlight source for using your cell phone as well as for using a camera to capture negatives and slides. Uh, to that end, if you're using the F2D Mighty or something along those lines or a scanner, you still need to sort and organize your stuff as you're going through the process and man, this is great compared to trying to hold something up to the ceiling light or your desk lamp or something to figure out what the hell you're looking at and do you have it backwards and all that other kind of stuff, sorting stuff. So good build regardless of what option you're going to use. Now, uh, this light board, cheap light board, maybe 20 bucks on Amazon or Fleabay. If you order one, an A4 size is really ideal or perfect for our application you want to try and get the brightest light board you can get, uh, preferably, you know, the higher the nit number is the relative brightness of it. Uh, so yeah, pick a bright one. I'll, I'll put the number for what this one claims to be uh, to give you a reference point. Uh, when you get your light board in, the next thing you'll need is a piece of glass to cover it. What I have found is that a 10 by 13 picture frame is just about perfect to cover the working surface leave you access to your power switch and give you some room for a piece of tape to kind of help hold your glass down at the bottom. So, if I keep touching the switch. Uh, so, 10 by 13 piece of glass. Now, uh, another problem I encountered in filming or taking pictures of these was that the negatives, whereas some of them are a little bit curved and whatnot, they were touching the glass in the front and where it touched and then curved away from the glass was actually making a pretty cool looking artifact but not something I wanted on my final images. So, uh, you know, get, a, get the thickest plastic street sign or no parking sign, whatever you can use, lay it out uh, with your light board to hold your negatives down and you will not have any diffraction issues with your negatives. Now, uh, I'll talk about the spacing just a bit before we go on and talk about our other two methods. I've got four rows of tape across the bottom. I used a thick cloth bandage tape to give me something to easily line up negatives and slides on. And I wanted to have four rows for a very valid reason. If you'll notice the size of this light board and the four negative strips or the negative strips with four frames that I have on it, you'll notice I can get two strips per row, which gives me a, a, a total of eight strips. Well, keep in mind that most rows of, rolls of film came in 24 exposure rolls, rolls, but often, if you, if you did it right and you knew your camera, you could, uh, you could get maybe 25 or 26 exposures out of a roll. And also, when they processed the film, a lot of times your roll didn't, uh, they didn't cut them all even, so you may end up with an odd a five and uh, or something a little longer. Where if you just had three rows, you wouldn't be able to fit a whole 24 exposure roll on here. So you do want four rolls. Now uh, I'm going to give you a magic number out here that I figured out trial and error over several builds of doing this kind of stuff, and that is two and five sixteenths inches. 
okay? If you space from the top of one row of tape or top of one row to the top of the next piece of the tape, if you use that measurement, it's tall enough to allow you to do 35 millimeter slides or full size slides or negatives and give you four rows. And if they're equally spaced, then the next rig or the next part of a rig I'm going to show you, uh, it'll come into play there with making you be able to very rapidly process rolls of films using a DSLR or camera. So uh, there you have it, A4 light board, good stuff. And uh, let's go ahead and talk about our cell phone. Digitizing with a Galaxy Note 9 cell phone. Okay, let's talk about our little cell phone rig. And again, you can anybody can pretty much figure out how to build this once you build your light board, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, the phone we're using in this example, or the images you're going to see uh, for comparison, is a Galaxy Note 9 with dual 12 megapixel cameras. Uh, that we're using for capturing. And I forget whether I used a 2x zoom or the wider angle one. I'll try and figure that out and post it in this video. Uh, so a couple of things about it. First, you build your light board, figure out the height you need to have your phone above the light board to be able to have your focusing system work reliably. Now, I would back it up a 16th or an eighth of an inch above that to give you a little bit of wiggle room in case your negatives may be a little bowed or for whatever reason. And measure that, cut foam core poster board at that height to hold your phone in place. Two or three pieces is all you really need. Uh, cut some additional pieces taller to hold your phone reliably into position. And if you want, you can even put a little cross brace, tape, glue, whatever. This one's kind of flimsy because I just taped it together because, hey, after this video, I'm not keeping this. It's going in the trash. So it's disposable. Uh, and I got better methods to do than this. So uh, that's, the, that's it. That's all there is to it. You will need software to do your processing and convert your negatives to positives in the case of negative film. Of course, slides are going to be right out of the box. Uh, whatever software you choose to use, uh, use, or maybe even just a phone app, depending on if you just want to do a couple. Uh, and to that end, just so you're aware, I've mentioned it before, I'm using Capture One version 20 by Phase One. That's the photo editing software that I'm using. That's a pretty powerful tool uh, and more than most people need, but apples to apples, that happens to be what I have and what I am using. So uh, there you have it, cell phone rig for the light board and this is exactly what I used in the examples you're going to see. Digitizing using a Panasonic G9 mirrorless camera. Okay, so let's talk about using a camera on a tripod to digitize our negatives. Now, uh, we already talked about making a light board to hold your negatives and slides. Of course, you'll be using that for this rig. And what we're actually using here is a Panasonic G9 20 megapixel mirrorless camera, interchangeable lens camera. And the lens we're using on the front is a 60 millimeter f2.8 macro lens, which means it has a very close up focus distance. I can actually focus literally about that far uh, and get a, almost virtually a full frame, 20 megapixel frame from one negative. Now, uh, so this is a very capable rig as far as photographing a negative. Now what I'll say is before I had this lens, I used a 12 by 60 travel zoom for my Panasonic. This wasn't a macro, but what I found when I zoomed it out all the way uh, to 60 millimeters, that at about six or eight inches away, I could actually photograph my negatives, pulling it in farther, and I managed to get about two thirds of the frame filled, which was more than adequate for most uses, okay? Uh, so whatever camera you have, uh, you'd be surprised at a lot of the decent pocket cameras, fixed lens cameras that, uh, 
how closely, if they've got the little flower for the macro mode to come in close, you might be able to get simply have, if you have one, or buy a small tripod ball head and be able to do this, do the same methodology that I'm using on this rig and get basically close to the same results. So uh, all that being said, uh, your mileage may vary. Play with what you have because to be honest, I was really surprised at some of the cameras and lenses that seemed to work uh, that I wouldn't have thought otherwise. And uh, so yeah, you'll want the light board anyway. Play with the cameras you've got before you go and order uh, some fancy Dumaflachi to do your scan. Now, uh, let's talk very briefly about the rest of the methodology to this is if you have a camera that will work for your purposes and a tripod to hold it, uh, once you get that rig put together and you know what you're going to use, on the back of your light board, make sure you're going parallel towards your top, put a strip across it and a couple of hockey pucks or something on the bottom there to make it to where it'll, it'll lay flush against something. Then all you have to do is get a 2x2 two two piece of Luan board, and I'm saying this very simplistically. Uh, there you go, there's a board that you can slide right across in front of your camera. Looks like went too far, bridge too far. Uh, that you can slide across your camera, in front of your camera, and take pictures. Four rows, and you can go ahead and as fast as you can. Slide this, line it up, picture, slide it, line it up, picture, so on and so forth. Uh, you can get eight, you know, you can do a whole roll of 24 once you put it on your holder in just a minute or two, actually capture all of those. Now, of course, with this method, just like with the cell phone, you're going to have negative images unless you're shooting slides, and you're going to have to process however you process them in your software. But, uh, but again, that's, that's the same rig, that is exactly the rig that we used to see the results you're about to look at in this video. This camera, this light board, the backboard, all utilized. Now, uh, if you want to see more details on how to build a backboard or something like this, because this is kind of designed as a system for everything has to be just right lineup wise uh, to work together or maybe not just right, but pretty darn close. But I can do a walkthrough video on building a light board like that if there's enough interest. So hey, like, share, subscribe, and post a comment below. So that's it, Panasonic G9 rig. That's the last of the four methods we're gonna test on our three different negatives. Let's look at some pictures. Individual results, overview, and methodology. Okay, so let's talk about how we're going to view these images so you have a better feel for, for what, what we're doing, our methodology, and everything else. Uh, first off, I'm using OBS software version 27 to do screen capture and annotate at the same time. And what we're going to do is look at all of these devices in the order of quality, or my perception thereof anyway, uh, highly subjective and dubious, and then a final comparison between all of these images. Now, we have three different negatives we scan. We have uh, all of these are from the 1980s, 35 millimeter color film uh, images. We have uh, myself on a camel in Egypt, F4s on a flight line, and ships at sea. Uh, we'll be looking at the process we went through to uh, get from here to there as well as some one-to-one -one crops. Now these crops, if you'll notice, are 1600 by 900 resolution images. So when I open them in the viewer software, they're pixel for pixel on the screen. So if you're running this full screen, you should be pixel for pixel too, okay? Now, uh, one other thing, uh, wherever possible, I edit using the item or the software for the item in question. However, I'm also doing editing with separate editing software. And in some cases, you absolutely have to. So all the software edits that I'm doing, and then I'll mention more about them as we go, are all going to be done using Capture One version 20 by Phase One photo editing software. So keep that in mind as we go along. 
And uh, with that, let's go ahead and we'll start off looking at our Note 9 images. Cell phone scan results. Okay, first up is our Galaxy Note 9, 12 megapixel camera. Here's our initial negative capture. Notice it's about 3,700 by 2,500 pixels in size if you were to blow it up all the way. Lots of, a few, quite a few spots and blemishes. Negative image. And here's our capture one edited image, which is also using a spot removal function uh, where you individually can blemish or blend out spots. Zoom in, there's our negative at a, hundred, at a one to one hundred percent uh, size. And our processed image, again, at one to one pixel peeping size. Second up, we have our F4 Phantoms on the flight line. Again, different spots and blemishes. There's our negative image. And this image has just had the negative to positive done, no other corrections. And finally, our Capture One edited image. Notice blemishes that have been blended out. One to one crops. There's our negative to positive image with some blemishes. And our Capture One image. Okay, third and final picture. We have our negative to positive image. Lots of ground in dirt and debris on this negative. We have scratches. We have some deeper gouges on it. Uh, throughout the negative, by far the most challenging one we're going to be working with today. And here's our capture one edited. Now this took a lot, these took, took a lot of time to process because we had a lot of spots, blemishes. We used spot removal tools as well as a healing layer to clone uh, adjacent areas of the screen semi-opaquely to blend out a lot of these flaws. I missed a couple down here. Okay, we're going to be looking at our crops from this ship on the right hand side. There is our negative to positive image. And there is our Capture One edited final image. Galaxy Note 9. Standalone Phototype Scanner Results. Next up we have our Wolverine F2D Mighty. Okay, before we get into the images, I did want to show you this. The Wolverine actually does a good bit of cropping on a 35 millimeter negative beyond uh, the edges. So you're going to miss a little bit of data. If you'll look, there's the left edge, right edge, and there's our centered image, which obviously is missing some on either side. So that being said, no corrections straight out of the F2D Mighty. Here is editing with the F2D Mighty to give it a better exposure. We use an EV of plus 0 0.5 and drop the green channel down by 0 minus, by minus 0 0.5 to give a little better image quality. And here's our Capture One edit uh, of that, ed, of that uh, adjusted image, also using the spot removal tool. Now, uh, like I said, there's very little you can do with the F2D. You can adjust overall exposure, your red, green, and blue channels, and that is the only correction you can do, and keep in mind this does not come with software. So you are limited, and one other thing is if you don't edit the color and it's way out like this, you may have a hard time correcting it in software. It wasn't as easy as I thought it should have been, so you do want to do your image correction as you're scanning the negatives. There's our corrected image with the F2D, and there's our final one-to-one -one crops. Next up, we have our phantoms. Uh, no corrections. Our correction was an EV of plus 0.5, and there's our capture one edited, uh, without doing any of the spot removal stuff. One-on-one uh, -on -one crop, uh, no, no corrections. There's the plus 0.5 EV, and there's our final crop from the Phase 1 software. On to our ships, no corrections, uh, corrected plus 0.5 EV, and lastly, our capture one edited with the software and again we use multiple tools within the software to do it and it was a little bit labor intensive 
Uh, same crop as before. Right hand ship. Notice how much is missing from this image based on the F2D's uh, built in limited size window. Plus 0.5 EV. And final edit from Capture One software. So that's it. That's uh, what you can expect out of the F2D Mighty. Traditional scanner results. Okay, next up is our Epson V600. All scans are being done at 4800 DPI. Uh, that gives us roughly a 6600 by 4400 resolution scan. Uh, here's the V600 with no corrections in the software whatsoever. Now, as we go along, there's only three things that we're going to adjust, although you have other tools, and I have used them in the past, but uh, to be honest, they're a little bit troublesome to use to try and adjust and get exactly what you want out of them. So I prefer to do more editing external out of the software, but I do use auto exposure. Uh, I usually turn off the unsharp match which mask, which softens a picture. Uh, I don't care for that. I would rather soften it in other software, so that's turned off. I use color restoration in some cases if needed. And I also use, and we'll, we'll be looking at dust removal and digital ice technology, which you can use one or the other, but not both simultaneously. By the way, this is the automatic frame selection window where you can choose which frames you want to keep and individually adjust each frame and tell it to go and it will scan uh, up to in the case of 35 millimeter negatives normally you can get about six or eight at a whack depending on how your negatives are cut okay going forward epson v600 auto exposure notice all the extra spots on the image uh, there's your color restoration and dust removal on low which as you can see, got rid of a fair amount of the artifacts and kind of minimized some of the uh, uh, brown spotting. Here's our one-to-one -one crop with no corrections, with exposure corrections, and there's a better image of these extra spots, which not all of them got removed. I probably could have gone a level up on that. And lastly, our fully corrected image, again, uh, using the Epson software. F4 Phantoms on the flight line. And this is uh, auto exposure only. There's our color restoration mode, which to me oversaturated, so I will not be using that on the remainder of the F4 images. Here's our dust removal on medium. Now notice that's much more effective on this in getting rid of uh, a lot of the spots. Dust removal on high, which additionally gets some other uh, blemishes and finally digital ice so we looking at the digital ice if you uh, if you're paying attention you can see a lot of spots reappeared with digital ice on that's because they weren't spots they were actually uh, things that were supposed to be there we did get rid of a lot of blemishes along the edge that the uh, dust removal could not get rid of as well so overall pretty good performance and lastly, here's our Capture One edited final version uh, to improve color contrast and whatnot. Uh, again, you could get close to that with the Epson software if you really want to play with it, but I find it easier to do it externally. And here's our one-to-one -one crops. Uh, auto exposure only. Auto exposure and dust removal high. Notice it took out uh, these uh, pieces of the image that it thought were thought was dust but were not and left a couple of artifacts. There's our digital ice which put those back in and also got rid of some other blemishes that the dust removal did not. And finally our post-processed Capture One image of the, of the uh, best scan with digital ice. Now uh, here's our most challenging negative. Here's out of the V600 auto exposure our ship image. There's auto exposure, which didn't do a lot for us, or auto exposure and color restoration, excuse me. Dust removal on high. Now you'll notice we're getting some effects as I'm toggling this, 
on the dust removal on high, a little bit of minimizing of some of the gratuitous cat hair on this particular image, uh, but not that great overall. Still a lot of post-processing work. On to the digital ice. You'll notice digital ice took care of the scratches, got rid of more of the artifacts, returned some things that weren't issues, also did a fairly good job at getting rid of our cat hair and minimizing our deeper gouges to a good degree. And finally, our Capture One edited image. Now, our one-to-one -one crop, same place as before. There's our gratuitous cat hair. And that's auto exposure, auto exposure plus color restoration, dust removal on high, and finally digital ice. Now you notice it did have a difficult time in where there's a lot of detail in this area and did leave some artifacts. And finally post-processed in Capture One to further restore color, contrast, and detail. Epson V600 and V550. Mirrorless SLR with macro lens results. Okay, last of our devices we're going to play with is the Panasonic G9 using a 60mm f2.8 macro lens. Now, uh, this first image is a full, full frame from the camera, or virtually full frame, and the reason I wanted to show you this is that if you choose to do this process and you make your masks to hold the negatives and everything else, what I would highly recommend is making it oversized for your negative to where you have a little bit of your drive, uh, your drive perforations showing. And the reason for that is you're going to come across negatives that are going to be very low contrast and you may have a very hard time autofocusing with your camera. And in those cases, you can shift your focus point down to the drive area where you have the contrast in order to get a good focus lock if it's a negative that's problematic otherwise. So I would highly recommend giving yourself a little bit of extra wiggle room at, a, at, a, at the cost of a slightly smaller final image. Okay, so enough of that. Let's go on and take a look. Okay, uh, negative to positive corrected, but no other corrections. Negative to positive corrected without any spot removal or any of that. Now notice the G9 has a color depth that it's really pulling out a lot of blemishes that otherwise you wouldn't have, which is a good thing. That's telling you that you're getting more data to work with. Okay, and here's the final corrected with spot removal and a healing layer in order to uh, get rid of all those blemishes, which is a little bit labor intensive, but the results are worthy. And next we have an 80 megapixel image, which is uh, done with the G9. It has a function where it uses your sensor shifting mechanism for uh, motion, anti-motion, anti-shake to actually take multiple images, interpolate them together, and blend them together to give you a much larger image than standard. If you'll notice, we have a 4400 by 29 or 3000 image on our 20 megapixel. And here we have a almost 9000 by 6000 resolution image. And you will notice just a slight difference in perceived detail when these are made to fit a certain screen size. So let's go ahead and zoom in. Uh, here's our corrected with spot removal and healing. And here's our 80 megapixel image of the same. Okay, next up we have our F4 Phantoms. Uh, negative to positive, no correction. And corrected without spot removal. Here's our uh, extra, little bit of extra labor in getting spot removal. Here's our 80 megapixel image. Again, as I'm cycling between these, Hopefully uh, this will show up in the final video when you view it full screen. But you can see you just have better definition throughout the image. So uh, not bad if you have a, a special image that you want to do the work on. And our close-up one-to-one crops. There's our corrected with spot removal done. 
and there is our one-to-one -one of our 80 megapixel image. Lastly, we have our ships, negative to positive with no corrections. Here is a color corrected, but no spot removal or layering to get rid of scratches, blemishes, and the splotches. Again, the G9 is capable of uh, having a really good dynamic range to where look at all the detail we could pull out of the clouds, uh, which is all good. However, it was also sensitive enough to capture deterioration on the negative, causing a lot of these the unusual yellow coloring both in the air and on the water. So now let's go ahead and look at our final. Now, uh, one thing I do want to go over in brief is when you're using your spot removal is just that. You click on a spot and it blends the surrounding area to get rid of it, uh, normally with very few artifacts. When you're using a healing layer, uh, basically you use a mask and paint it on and you select where in the image you want it to pull something to cover up. So normally... I'll do two healing layers, one for vertical, one for horizontal, like this uh, blemish right here. Whoops, if I can zoom in. Things like this that are more horizontal in nature. And like this scratch going across. Uh, but I'll use two layers and I'll pick a spot just adjacent to it. And then make it semi-opaque to where it blends over very nicely. Now, uh, lots of work. Uh, there's also one additional layer where I just painted a mask over the worst colored areas and attempted to correct over it. And I could have done a little better job, uh, but it, overall it is a much improved image with the coloring. So, And finally we have our 80 megapixel image, which again you can see a better perception of clarity and detail. I did not do all the extra corrections because uh, it was a lot of work to get there and I've already done it half a dozen times. Uh, in for our last and final zoom-ins here, we have our corrected and healed image and our 80 megapixel. And here's where you can see, in this case, some artifacting because of the image uh, blending from our 80 megapixel multi-frame image combined. So there you have it, Panasonic G9. Final comparison between methods and devices. Okay, a quick note before we look at our final comparison between all four of these devices or four methods that we have on the table. First, please keep in mind this is subjective, okay? Uh, the cell phone is my cell phone, Note 9, Samsung. Uh, it is what it is. Yours is going to probably be different. The camera I'm using is a Panasonic G9, which is a very capable micro four-thirds large sensor mirrorless camera. And if you're using a point-and-shoot or something with a small sensor, your output's going to be different. So obviously these are just showing the methods, but there's going to be a highly flexible result for you. Now, the F2D and the V600, uh, the output is what it is, but in the first set of finals, all of these were post-edited in Capture One version 20. Uh, the reason I did that is because there are benefits to doing that. I didn't want to shortchange the F2D or the V600 for what you're capable of getting out of those units, so we're going to look at apples to apples, everything processed with Capture One or Capture One version 20. Uh, now, right after that, we'll come back and we'll take a look at the output directly from these two compared to the Capture One edits, just so you can kind of quantify how much of a difference that makes. And one last note, keep in mind, I did not tweak the V600 images and really mess around with the driver software because it can do better than that, do a lot of what I did in Capture One. It's just more tedious for me to use it and it takes time to learn it and everything else. So this would be a, hey, I just set it up, click, 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 scan type of output. So keep that in mind as well. So with that being said, Let's go ahead and do our final roundup. Okay, so now we're at the final showdown between all four of these devices and their output. Note 9. F2D.
V600. G9. Crops. Note 9. F2D Mighty. V600 or V550. Panasonic G9. F4 Phantoms, G9, or, uh, Ga or Galaxy Note 9, sorry. The 9's got me again. F2D Mighty. V600. G9. And I could have color corrected that a little better, I have to say. That's my bad, not the software. Crops. Note 9. F2D Mighty. V600. Note 9, or I'm not going to get it right yet, G9, goodness gracious. And lastly, our ship images. Note 9, F2D. V600, G9, and final crops. Note 9, F2D. V600, and by the way, not all the images obviously had the cat hair. And G9. And that concludes our review of the edited uh, capture one edited images so let's go back take a look at our f2d real quick between its native output via whatever buttons you can push on the front of it uh, and the capture one output
and lastly our V600 output. Now keep in mind that with the V600 uh, using the screen I showed you earlier and the software you can get better results. It's just very tedious using the driver software. Additionally the V600 I purchased came with some budget photo editing software. You're not getting Lightroom or Phase 1 or Capture 1 or nothing like that. But it did come with some photo editing software. So the reality of it is, is you could get better results than what I demonstrated using the automated faster process with, uh, with the V600. So just keep that in mind. You, you can get better quality than what I'm showing you in this particular little subset, but it's it'll be a little bit tedious, and uh, if you have other software, you're probably going to want to use it anyway. And there you have it. I hope that uh, if you found value in all of this, that you'll like, share, and subscribe. And uh, please, by all means, uh, if you do so, post some comments if you're interested in getting an in-depth review and tutorial kind of sort of on the V600 or on how to use your DSLR uh, or how to build a rig to use your DSLR and some methodologies to make that about as uh, good as it can get. So uh, both those are potential upcoming videos. So like, share and subscribe. And thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the Digitize Your Negatives video. If so, please like, share, and subscribe. This video took a lot of time and effort to produce, and while it's free to download for personal or educational use, please link, give credit, and commercial use is forbidden without written consent. Thanks for watching.